Hello and welcome to Rewind 2022. I'm Jason Davis. And I'm Kyla Barrage. We'll be looking back at some of the major stories from the past year. And what a year it has been. We begin with new leadership at the Tourism Authority. In January, the St. Kitts Tourism Authority announced the appointment of Ellison Thompson as CEO. In this role, Thompson would lead international marketing efforts for the destination with a focus on trade and airline relationships, earned paid and owned media, partnerships and stakeholder communication. Thompson said he was looking forward to developing and implementing creative strategies that will increase St. Kitts' visibility in key source markets, put St. Kitts into the consideration set for travelers, and ultimately drive bookings. Mr. Thompson served as Deputy Director General of the Bahamas Ministry of Tourism. He also led the sales team in the United States, Canada, and Europe, as well as Asia and Latin America. In recognition of International Women's Day in March, the Department of Gender Affairs honored seven women for their contributions to the Federation. Tressa Wyatt was recognized for her contributions in the area of digital economy. Teresa Grio King for work in the blue economy. Alice Watts for the green economy. Marissa Grant Tate, women in science category. Carrie Tuckett for COVID response and recovery and Dianeal Taylor-Williams for the green economy. At the ceremony held at the National Heroes Pack, Gender Field Officer Chanel Charles emphasized that women are important agents of change. Women's contribution in building resilient communities to climate and environmental actions is evident in their involvement in women's civil society organizations, cooperatives, enterprises and formal businesses. Their provision of unpaid labor, care for the natural environment, leverage of generational knowledge and practices and embrace of new and different technologies serve to improve economic opportunities and assist women in their transformation into building of emerging economies. As such, Women are important agents of change, and without their input, policies and strategies cannot be designed for the entire community. Delivering the featured address, Dame Constance Mitchum DBE spoke of the strides made in the 1980s in the area of gender equality and encouraged both men and women to continue efforts for gender parity. Women and men could make this year 2022 and beyond a time when they actively continue to promote such issues as equal pay for equal work, wherever such inequality still exists. We must strive to put an end to the game of calling the work that women do by one name in order to pay them less, while labeling with another name the same work that men do in order to pay them more. Companies should start taking a proactive step to bring about gender parity in their organizations. Since as the local theme suggests, equality today will help to maintain a sustainable tomorrow. Minister of Gender Affairs Honorable Eugene Hamilton spoke of the resilience of the Federation's women and congratulated those awarded at the ceremony. I would like to think, and I hope you agree, that our women are resilient, our women are strong, and our women folk are resourceful. The resourcefulness is expressed daily, repeatedly, constantly, and does not go unnoticed by the good thinking people in our Federation. Of St. Kitts and Nevis. The ceremony also saw the recognition of Hildred Carey of Tabernacle, who received the Prime Minister's Award. International Women's Day 2022, held on March 8th, was guided by the campaign theme Break the Bias. In March, the police investigated a fire at the Joshua Obadiah Williams Primary School and determined that it was intentionally carried out. Here's more in this report. 
Assistant Commissioner of Police with Responsibility for Crime, Andre Mitchell, visited the scene with a team of senior investigators on Saturday. ACP Mitchell described the fire as a malicious act, saying, quote, preliminary investigations so far have revealed that the fire was no accident. We have identified the areas in which several fires were lit. I am dismayed with the extent to which a person or persons have gone to damage an institution of learning that caters to our children. A vigorous investigation is being conducted to find and bring to justice the person or persons responsible for the crime, ACP Mitchell stated. Meanwhile, the police are offering a reward of EC $35,000 for information that leads to the arrest and successful prosecution of the person or persons responsible for the fire at the Joshua Abadai Williams Primary School. Sunday Commissioner of Police Hilwai Brandy visited the scene in Molyneux and expressed his disgust with the matter. He was quoted as saying, regardless of the motive, this malicious offense has adversely affected scores of our nation's youth who deserve to learn in a comfortable environment. We are taking this matter very seriously and will need all the help we can get to solve the case. Anyone who may have information that can move this investigation forward is asked to call the Tabernacle Police Station at 465-7227, the nearest police station, or the crime hotline at 707, where information can be given anonymously. Investigations into the matter are ongoing. In April, the National Emergency Management Agency carried out a tsunami evacuation drill and used the experience to determine what needs to be done to achieve the desired results. Here's more. On the 25th of March, NEMA hosted a tsunami evacuation drill as part of the Carib Wave exercise taking place throughout the region. This year's event focused on the residents of the Old Road community, and since then, officials at NEMA have been reviewing the outcome. According to Planning Officer Orika Lennon Petty, the response was mixed. Some person said, Oh, it's just an exercise, I'm not going to evacuate. If it was a real event, I would have evacuated. We had one positive response that stood out for me was that this lady was actually in, in Oro doing barbecue chicken. She actually packed up everything and went to higher ground. So I thought that was commendable, you know, because it showed that she valued her life more than, you know, making money. We um, had a lot of response in terms of persons evacuating because the area has about, what, 2,000 residents. We had about 20 to 30 persons who actually evacuated. So that spoke volumes for us in terms of what we need to do. It identified what we need to do, that we need to do more um, public awareness activities in that. She explained the steps they plan to take to increase community response in upcoming drills. We'll go a different route in, you know, maybe having persons gather at one spot and then evacuating and using that as a chance to educate the public and then maybe we'll run it again in the way we did it originally to see if the response will be different. Mrs. Lennon Petty said the main objective is to improve residents' response, first responders' preparation, and the efficiency of NEMA and other volunteers. Ultimately, it's just the preparedness, how prepared we are to respond to a threat of a tsunami. We want persons to know what to do in the event of and to use the opportunity to practice because, you know, they say practice makes perfect and it's good to practice because then when a real event comes, persons won't panic and instead they will act. She said NEMA hosts exercises throughout the year and the tsunami drill will be replicated in other districts in the future. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. After an incident involving a Russian St. Kitts and Nevis citizen and some children at the Cotton Ground Beach in Nevis in April, the Nevis Island Administration issued a statement. Here's more. Following an incident in which a woman protested activities on the Cotton Ground Bay in Nevis on Saturday, Honorable Mark Brantley, Premier of Nevis, issued a statement. The statement said, quote, a very disturbing video of young primary school children practicing for the annual inter-primary school meet on a public beach being interfered with by a woman who sought to disrupt their use of the beach has been brought to the attention of the Nevis Island Administration. Mr. Brantley continued, quote, I wish to be clear that all beaches on the island of Nevis are public property and therefore free for the use and enjoyment of all members of the public. 
those who visit our island or choose to live on our island are welcomed and will experience no warmer or more genuine hospitality anywhere else in the world. I wish to be pellucid, however, that our generous hospitality must not be abused." End quote. He described the woman's behavior as unacceptable and offensive that, quote, must be condemned unreservedly. He said, I gather that the woman involved and her spouse have apologized for their actions to the coaches, parents, and students. I have nevertheless asked the Ministry of Education to investigate and report further on the incident. I am to hope that there will never ever be a repeat of such behavior on Nevis, whether by her or anyone else." End quote. In videos of the incident posted online, the lady observed the athletes who were training along the sand for relay races. She then proceeds to lay on the beach in the way of the children running, causing one child to jump over her. It is alleged that she phoned the police. Calls to the Charlestown and Cotton Ground police stations in Nevis confirmed that an anonymous call was lodged. The officer said that someone tried to lay claim to the beach. According to the officer, it was later settled as the woman's husband got involved in calming the situation. Police are still looking into an allegation of a payment made by the woman to the St. Thomas's Primary School the school that the children attend. In April, the Federation bid a final farewell to former Premier of Nevis, Ambassador His Excellency Vance Amory, who passed away while overseas. His body arrived in St. Kitts and Nevis in late April, welcomed by members of the security forces and government officials. More in this report. The body of His Excellency Ambassador Vance Amory arrived at the Robert L. Bradshaw International Airport from the United Kingdom on Wednesday to a military reception. Draped in the national flag of St. Kitts and Nevis, the casket arrived on board British Airways and was welcomed by government officials, including Premier of Nevis, Honorable Mark Brantley, Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris, and Deputy Prime Minister Honorable Sean Richards. The body was received by the military and transferred to the Jenkins Funeral Home hearse. From the airport, the procession made its way along Wellington Road onto Keon Street to the funeral home for the body to be prepared for viewing later this week. The body of the late Vance Amory will lie in state here at government headquarters for the next few days. On Thursday, the viewing will take place from 9.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. and on Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Following the viewing on Friday, the body will be taken to Nevis where it will lie in state within the next week. The funeral service of Ambassador His Excellency Vance Amory will take place on April 30th. Reporting from government headquarters for ZIZ News, I'm Carla Verich. That following weekend, the nation bid a final farewell to the late Ambassador Vance Amory with a state funeral in Nevis. The state service was held at the El Camino Willett Park, where government officials and visiting dignitaries joined family members and friends in paying their final respects to the late Vance Amory. The service was officiated by clergy representing member churches of the Nevis Christian Council and the Evangelical Association of Nevis, and the very Reverend Ernest Alroy Fleming, bishop-elect of the Anglican Diocese of the Northeastern Caribbean and Aruba, who who delivered the sermon. Among those paying tribute to the late Vance Amory was Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris. We are better today as a nation and as a people because of the profound lessons received from a prominent stalwart who resolutely refused to accept and perform service that was strained by mediocrity and self-aggrandizement. Self he was the true embodiment of our motto, country above self. The service also included tear-filled tributes by Mr. Amory's daughter and grandchildren and the eulogy presented by his brother, Murray Amory. Among those reading lessons were Premier of Nevis, the Honorable Mark Brantley, and Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honorable Dr. Denzil Douglas. From the park, the procession made its way to the St. George's Anglican Church Cemetery in Gingerland for the graveside service and the burial of the late Vance Amory. Reason! Jason Davis for ZIZ News.
In the first week of June, government officials and students joined Governor General His Excellency Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, GCMG CVO QCJP LLD, at Government House for a tree planting ceremony to commemorate the Platinum Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. Here's more. This ceremony launched an island-wide tree planting initiative and was one of several activities being planned to observe the event, which commemorates her 70-year reign as monarch. Delivering brief remarks, Governor General, His Excellency Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, GCMG, CVOQ, CJP, LLD, explained that while the ceremony celebrated the Queen's anniversary, the focus is on responding to climate change. It is useful to note that the emphasis being placed this morning is on tree planting. And that is something that is symbolic of our action to promote the efforts of climate change. Climate change has come as a challenge to all of our countries. And one of the aspects of it that can counter climate change is the planting of trees. The tree planting falls in line with the Queen's Green Canopy Initiative, which marks the 2022 Jubilee by inviting persons to plant a tree for the Jubilee. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris explained the importance of the act of planting trees to Her Majesty the Queen. Throughout the Queen's reign, she has officially planted more than 1,500 trees, trees all over the world. And today we stand united with other nations in the Commonwealth family to participate in this tree planting, which has become the commencement activity for her Platinum Jubilee. Later this year, 70 trees will be planted in various locations around the island as part of an initiative spearheaded by the Department of Youth. Another activity held that week to mark the Queen's 70th anniversary was a beacon lighting ceremony at Government House. At exactly 9.45 p.m., Governor General, His Excellency Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, GCMG, CVO, QCJP, LLD, lit the beacon in sync with other ceremonies around the globe. The beacon ceremony took place across the UK and in all Commonwealth member countries. In a statement, the Governor General was quoted as saying, A 70th anniversary is indeed a milestone, but this Platinum Jubilee is a unique occasion. Others, though few in number, have reached their Diamond Jubilee, but a Platinum Jubilee signifies the longest in history." End quote. Delivering brief remarks on behalf of the Prime Minister, Director General of the St. Kitts and Nevis Information Service, Les Roy Williams, spoke of the historic nature of the anniversary and the significance of the beacon. Queen Elizabeth II will be chronicled in history as the first British sovereign to have ever accrued 70 years on the throne, initiating this platinum jubilee commemoration. Our beacon lighting ceremony today represents two of our fundamental elements as a people, unity and hope. Among those in attendance were Deputy Prime Minister Honorable Eugene Hamilton, Attorney General Honorable Vincent Byron, and Resident Ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan, Michael Lin. And speaking of queens, in July, then reigning National Carnival Queen Nakira Nichols captured yet another title, the 59th Miss JC's Crown. More in this report. The competition took place on Wednesday night at the Antigua Recreation Grounds. Nichols was also adjudged the best interview, best swimsuit, best talent, best modeling skills in evening wear, and most true to theme. In a Facebook post, the St. Kitts Nevis Carnival Committee said, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, our National Carnival Queen, Nikiwa Nichols, is the 2022 JC's Caribbean Queen. She was elegant, poised, and articulate. Heartiest congratulations, end quote. Corner Can of Trinidad and Tobago secured the first runner-up position, while second runner-up went to Winnie Vernet, who also won Best Dressed for Evening Wear. Reigning National Carnival Queen and new Miss JC's Nikira Nichols returned home on Friday morning wearing her new crown as she walked through the welcome lounge of Kayanjet. 
she expressed thanks for all the support. First, I want to really give gratitude and thank everyone, all of the citizens, everyone for supporting me throughout my journey. For Miss St. Kitts and of course for the Miss JC Queen pageant, I saw all the flags on the life and I'm really, really appreciative for all the support throughout the journey and throughout the show. Thank you very, very much. I love you guys. Welcoming the new queen back home, Trevisia Adams, the chair of the National Carnival Queen Pageant Committee, spoke of how proud she was. On behalf of the National Carnival Queen Pageant Committee, the National Carnival Committee, and the 2021 National Carnival Queen contestants, we just want to wish you ta thank you for representing the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis so proud. We are always happy from the Carnival Committee perspective when our contestants are able to represent our Federation. But we are always one ounce happier when our, queen, when our Queen wins and we are elated for you. We are happy and we are extremely proud. And we want to also thank your chaperone, Miss Ozel Martin, the Miss JC's veteran chaperone, for also sticking up sticking around with you. She was with you for the National Carnival Queen pageant. And she was also with you for the Miss JC's pageant. And we want to thank you, Ozel, for always being able to assist our queens in representing St. Kitts and Nevis at the base. Nichols was chaperoned by Ozel Martin, who accompanied her to Antigua. Still in July, 13 nationals were awarded for their contribution to the development of the nation in various areas. Two investiture ceremonies were held at Government House. Here's more. An investiture ceremony was held on Wednesday morning at Government House to present the Companion of the Star of Merit to persons who were announced on National Heroes Day in 2021. The award was presented to Lorna Alethea Callender for Education and Journalism, Ralph Lionel Gums for Business Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Howard Noel McEachran for Business Entrepreneurship, Ernest Charles Ashton Amory, MBE, for Business Entrepreneurship and Philanthropy, and Franklin Brand for Business Stewardship and Community Activism. Absent was Ural St. Clair Swanston, who was awarded for Social and Economic Development of Nevis from the 60s to the 80s. The second investiture ceremony, which was held on Thursday morning, marked the presentation of the Medal of Honor to seven women in recognition of their years of service to the Federation. The award was presented to Robley Jean for nursing, Anika Pitt-Hazel also for nursing, Elizabeth Collins Woodley for nursing and community services, Helena Maisie Nana Stapleton for entrepreneurship in market vending, Isilma Telmadri Springer in education, Palsy Lorna Wilkin also in education, and Ingrid Charles Gums for education and community service. Addressing the recipients, Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris commended them on their service to the nation and made note of the sacrifices they have made throughout their lives. They all labored long and hard in the vineyard of public service. They acquitted themselves well, and today we ask them to savor their journeys. We sincerely hope that they are minded to consider the sacrifices along the way to have been worth it at the end. He said the virtues for which the awardees are being recognized are the core of what make our nation great and commended them on being living examples of the national motto, country above self. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. Now leading up to the middle of the year, tensions were rising among parties that made up the Team Unity administration. There were concerns and issues raised among the leaders of the CCM and PAM, the People's Action Movement, specifically referring to the leadership of Dr. Timothy Harris. In mid-April, a meeting of the three party leaders of the Team Unity construct was held at government headquarters. And then Prime Minister and leader of the People's Labour Party, Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris announced efforts to improve issues raised. Deputy Leader and Leader of the People's Action Movement, Sean Richards, however, shared another view. Here's that story. 
Following the meeting of the three party leaders of Team Unity at government headquarters on Thursday, Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris has announced a framework to address issues raised. In a national address on Thursday night, the Prime Minister said the framework will introduce a code of conduct for the better functioning of Cabinet. He also spoke of new regulations for ministries and plans to review portfolio assignments. I further propose that all ministries should be subject to greater accountability to the Cabinet through regular reporting so that members may be better apprised of the workings of the entire government. In response to demands that portfolios be reassigned, I committed to undertake a review of the makeup of the Cabinet in due course with a view to improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the government as a whole. Meanwhile, leader of the People's Action Movement, the Honorable Sean Richards, says he is dissatisfied with the outcome of the meeting of party leaders of Team Unity. In a video statement on his Facebook page, Minister Richards said, although there was some progress in addressing concerns, it was not enough. While there was some minor progress on a few issues, it was not what the country needed for an urgent resolution. Unfortunately, the gulf between what is required to save the partnership and the preferences of the Prime Minister remain large and troubling. Both the leaders of PAM and CCM presented reasonable proposals that we felt would have adequately addressed important issues of national interest, such as good governance, transparency and accountability but it turned out to be a bridge too wide for the Prime Minister to cross. He said even after this second meeting, there has been no resolution to addressing the issues of distrust. About a week later, more cracks began to show in the union of the three parties and the leader of the People's Action Movement issued a statement accusing Dr. Harris of undermining their partnership. In the statement, Mr. Richard said that both PAM and the CCM have raised issues concerning the Team Unity Coalition with Prime Minister Harris, but they have had no satisfactory response. He said all of the attempts at resolution have failed, and he went on to accuse the Prime Minister of working against his Team Unity partners. One man who has presided over a systematic campaign of undermining his own ministers of government and undermining the operations of the ministries overseen by the cabinet members who happen to represent the CCM and PAM. He also accused the Prime Minister, who leads the People's Labour Party, of plotting to run against PAM and CCM candidates, as well as withholding benefits for certain constituents. In recent years, Dr. Harris has sought to gain a foothold for his own party in constituencies represented by CCM and PAM, while also withholding social benefits that were needed for our constituents, even though those benefits were generated from government resources. He said the latest developments have forced many of the elected ministers to take action. I repeat, we have tried, but as I have said before, Every time we tried by offering an open hand of partnership, Dr. Harris extended a closed fist of deception, delay, and mistrust. Therefore, we have been left with no alternative but to take decisive action. Given that he has refused to resolve, he left us with no alternative but to dissolve. We have acted in the interest of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Therefore, today, 21st April 2022, six of nine government MPs have decided to act to preserve the gains of the last six years and to build on this foundation we have laid. He said the six MPs also informed the Governor General they repose their full trust and confidence in the Honorable Sean Richards to serve as Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. And the political back and forth continued when in late April, a motion of no confidence was filed in the leadership of then Prime Minister Harris. 
A group of elected parliamentarians has filed a motion of no confidence in Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris in an effort to remove him from his position as Prime Minister. This was confirmed by Deputy Prime Minister and Leader of the People's Action Movement, Honorable Sean Richards, during a statement to the media on Tuesday morning at the Marat Resort. Therefore, on Monday, 25th April, 2022, the majority of members of the Team Unity Government formally lodged with the Clerk of Parliament a motion of no confidence in the leadership of the Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Harris. We expect that in keeping with the rules of Parliament, that the motion will be placed on the order paper for an urgent sitting and that a sitting of Parliament to hear the motion will be scheduled at the earliest possibility. Indeed, we have been advised that this should be done within 21 days. The motion of no confidence is the latest in a series of moves by Pam and CCM parliamentarians who have said they've lost confidence in the leadership of Dr. Harris. Over the past few weeks, both Minister Richards and CCM leader Honorable Mark Brantley have outlined their concerns and have expressed their dissatisfaction with the Prime Minister's response. This, they said, has led them to take this step of filing a motion of no confidence, which they expect to lead to either the resignation of the Prime Minister or the dissolution of Parliament and the calling of fresh elections. On May 10th, then Prime Minister Harris had what appeared to be the last word when he fired six ministers and dissolved Parliament, setting up for another general election. Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris has reshuffled cabinet portfolios, fired several government ministers, and announced the dissolution of cabinet. During a national address aired on Tuesday afternoon, the Prime Minister described the PAM and CCM members' absences from cabinet meetings as, quote, a flagrant disregard for their sworn duty to cabinet and by extension our people and country, end quote. This, he said, led, them, led him to advise the Governor General to remove Honorable Sean Richard as Deputy Prime Minister. He said five other ministers have been fired and stripped of their ministerial portfolios as well. I am also to advise that I have asked His Excellency to revoke the appointments of the other ministers who have thought it fit to disrespect the sacred trust that the people of St. Kitts and Nevis place in the government following our very successful general election campaign in 2020. As a result, the following individuals, namely the Honourable Mark Brantley, the Honourable Lindsay Grant, the Honourable John L. Powell, the Honourable Alexis Jeffers, the Honourable Eric Evelyn, have been stripped of their appointments as Ministers of Government. The Prime Minister wrapped up his address by announcing the dissolution of Parliament ahead of the general elections. The time for decision-making is at hand. Accordingly, I have asked the Governor-General to dissolve the Parliament of St. Kitts and Nevis, effective today, May 10th, 2022. Following the announcement of the firing of ministers and the dissolution of Parliament, ZIZ's cameras went out and spoke to the public. And whilst most people were reluctant to go on camera, there were a few who gave their opinions on the latest developments within government. Sean, Lindsey Grant, John L. Powell being fired from the cabinet. So it's two people running the country now, the Prime Minister and the Governor General. The police have got a handful now. Everything at stake now. So we're looking at election in, in August between September 2022. It's a good announcement to know that, well, the Unity Party will be going in the dust of the wind. Labour going to run this country again. Good announcement. What do you think about Timothy firing them? It's called for a long time now, Molly. Said people need to be free. It's about time. 
Over the next few weeks, all parties stepped into high gear for campaign mode. Party conventions saw supporters coming out in their numbers to support their representatives. The People's Action Movement and the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party launched new faces to their lineup, and the People's Labour Party, for the first time, launched a full slate of candidates for all eight constituencies. Dr. Harris announced Election Day as Friday, August 5, and all parties hit the ground running to gain as much support as possible in the next few weeks. But in the midst of all the campaigning, persons were also looking forward to the return of the St. Kiss Music Festival after being sidelined by the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's a look back at the first night. The St. Kitts Music Festival returned with a bang on Thursday night. Soca was the flavor of the night with a sprinkle of dancehall, with national and regional acts delivering high-energy performances to get the crowd jumping. The performers from the Federation were especially glad to return to the music festival stage. EBJ Harmonics kicked off the night showcasing their skills and showing why they're the Panorama Champs two years running. Rukas H.E. said he came in prepared to give the audience a treat. Being on stage is always one of those things that I look forward to because I always look forward to pleasing the fans. And I know that they too have been missing the Sinkers Music Festival. They have been missing in action for two years now. You know, so me getting back on stage, it really felt like home. It felt like something, look, it even felt better than other years. <laughs> Royston, Mr. World Wiggly of the Small Axe Band, said he fed off the crowd's energy. To be, to be on at that moment first, you know, in the first place as a band, you know, the crowd actually grew because, you know, the music was, was pulsating and the people seems to gravitate to what we were playing. So the gate we see supposed to be looking good. Lead singer Smiley of the Grandmasters Band was also happy with the crowd's response to their return to the stage. It was greatly anticipated. I know they were longing for something like this and to see that it's kicked off and, and here, yes, the crowd, um, they gobbled it up, <laughs> if I could put it in so much words. Soka stars Lyrical and Nadia Batson were next on the stage, entertaining the crowd with their hits, including a duet together. They were followed by Voice, who serenaded the ever-growing crowd with numerous hits from his catalogue. The night took on a different type of energy with the arrival of Masika, who injected a dose of dancehall with his set. Following Masika, it was right back to Soka with the Queen of Bacchanal, Destra, and Bacchanal the band, who had the crowd jumping and waving with her high-energy hits. Soka power couple Bungie Garland and Feyan Lyons were next on the stage who kept the crowd dancing while showcasing some new talent as well. And national band New Vibes capped off the night, performing numerous hits from throughout the years into the wee hours of Friday morning. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. Back on the election track, after weeks of campaigning, the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party was victorious at the polls on August 5. Here's more. According to results announced by election supervisor Elvin Bailey on Friday night into Saturday morning, Dr. Jeffrey Hanley won constituency number one for the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party with 1,997 votes. PLP's Jacqueline Bryan amassed 737 votes and Pam's Natasha Gray Brooks 745 votes. SKNLP's Marsha Henderson won constituency 2 with 1,841 votes, beating out Pam's John L. Powell with 737 votes and PLP's Nubian Greer with 707 votes. Conris Maynard secured constituency number 3 with 1,747 votes for the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party. PLP's Akila Byron Nisbet amassed 720 votes and Pam's Kervin Freeman 300 votes. Samal Duggins won constituency number 4 for the SKNLP with 1,269 votes, defeating incumbent Lindsey Grant in every box. Mr. Grant amassed 761 votes for PAM. PLP's Kendale Liburd secured 293 votes. Dr. Denzel Douglas retained constituency number 6 with 1,926 votes, beating out PLP's Mark Williams with 209 votes and Pam's Troy Flanders with 98 votes. 
and Dr. Terence Drew won constituency number eight with 2,950 votes. Pam's Chesley Hamilton amassed 895 votes, and PLP's Andrew Talbo Bass, 761 votes. Sean Richards retained his seat in constituency number five, the only seat for Pam, with 1,025 votes. SKNLP's Kenneth Douglas amassed 825 votes, and PLP's Stasia Williams, 243 votes. Dr. Timothy Harris held on to his seat in constituency number seven, with 1,266 votes. SKNLP's Leon Nata Nelson amassed 903 votes and Pam's Lincoln David Pell 176 votes. In Nevis, the CCM secured all three seats with Mark Brantley retaining constituency number 9 with 1,685 votes, defeating NRP's Patricia Bartlett with 1,279 votes and MRM's Samuel Keynes with 77 votes. Eric Evelyn held on to constituency number 10 with 616 votes, beating out NRP's Rohan Isles, 229 votes. And in constituency number 11, Alexis Jeffers Queeley retained his seat with 1,172 votes, narrowly defeating NRP's Janice Daniel Hodge with 1,113 votes. MRM's Patricia Mills Jeffers amassed 22 votes in that constituency. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. And decked out in red, SKNLP supporters took to the streets the following day to celebrate. Hundreds of St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party supporters took the streets on Saturday to celebrate their party's victory at the polls. Decked out in red, uh, the supporters gathered at various locations or drove around in mini motorcades to mark the victory. Supporter Jacintia Tishera said it was a proud moment for her. It is a new day here in St. Kitts and Nevis. History has been made. The new Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis is Dr. The Honorable Terence Drew from constituency number eight. Me and my neighbor voted for Labour. On August 6th, leader of the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party, Dr. Terence Drew, was sworn in as the new Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. Leader of the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party, Dr. Terence Drew, has been sworn in as the new Prime Minister, St. Kitts and Nevis. A swearing in ceremony was held at Government House on Saturday afternoon, where Dr. Terence Drew and other elected members of the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party were in attendance. His Lordship Honorable Justice Trevor Ward administered the oath of allegiance, the oath of office, and the oath of secrecy. In his acceptance speech, Dr. Drew plead, pledged to work towards the betterment of the country and the people. It is indeed an esteemed pleasure to be given the opportunity by the people of St. Peter's and Nevis to be their Prime Minister. I consider it an office of service. And I also recognize that it is an office that I do not own and I am holding here at the behest of the people. And I also know that I'm here for a limited time. And during the time that I'm here, I vow to work closely with the members of my cabinet to be there shortly, to work with those who are in other positions in government, and most of all, to work with our citizens, to extend a hand much closer to our federation system, or to our sister island, Needs so that whatever issues there are, that we can solve and resolve to bring our federation ever closer together. He said he looks forward to serving the federation over the next five years with distinction, transparency, and integrity. Another swearing in ceremony will be held in the near future to assign the various portfolios to other members of cabinet. The following week, Prime Minister Drew and other elected SKNLP representatives took a tour of government headquarters on his first day on the job. After being sworn in as the fourth Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis on Saturday, the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, accompanied by his soon-to-be-sworn-in cabinet colleagues and party supporters, ceremoniously walked into his new office at government headquarters to officially begin his work on behalf of the people. 
before heading inside the Prime Minister and his cabinet colleagues paused for a photo opportunity at the entrance of government headquarters. Once inside, the Prime Minister was given a tour of the facilities and was introduced to staff. He was also taken to the office he will occupy for the duration of his tenure. The team converged in the conference room where they participated in a group photo and it is expected that a similar exercise will be carried out across all existing ministries. And in the final step to installing a new government, the new cabinet was sworn in at Warner Park during a swearing-in ceremony on Saturday, August 13. The Oath of Allegiance, the Oath of Office, and the Oath of Secrecy were administered by Justice Trevor Ward, QC. Prime Minister and Parliamentary Representative for Constituency No. 8, the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, is the Minister of Finance, National Security, Citizenship and Immigration, Health and Social Security. Parliamentary Representative for Constituency No. 1, Dr. the Honorable Jeffrey Hanley, is Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Education, Youth, Social Development, Gender Affairs, Aging and Disabilities. Parliamentary Representative for Constituency No. 2, the Honorable Marsha Henderson, is Minister of Tourism, Civil Aviation and Urban Development. Parliamentary Representative for Constituency No. 3, the Honorable Conris Maynard, is Minister of Public Infrastructure and Utilities, Transport, Information, Communication and Technology, and Post. Parliamentary Representative for Constituency No. 4, the Honorable Samuel Duggins, is Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Marine Resources, Entrepreneurship, Cooperatives, and the Creative Economy. Parliamentary Representative for Constituency No. 6, the Right Honorable Dr. Denzel Douglas, is Minister of Foreign Affairs, Economic Development, Investment, International Trade, Industry and Commerce. The Honorable Garth Wilkin has also been sworn in as Attorney General and Minister of Justice and Legal Affairs. Senator, the Honorable Dr. Joyle Clark, is Minister of Sustainable Development, Climate Action and Constituency Empowerment. Iseline Philip has been sworn in as Senator in the National Assembly. The St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party won the federal general elections on August 5, taking six of the 11 seats that were contested. The Honorable Dr. Terence Michael Drew was officially sworn in on Saturday, August 6, as the fourth Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Christopher and Nevis during a ceremony at Government House. On September 8th, head of the Commonwealth, Queen Elizabeth II, passed away and various dignitaries offered words of condolences following the news of her death. His Excellency the Governor-General, Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, GCMG, CVO, QCJ, PLLD, has been officially advised of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The Governor-General has expressed great sadness at her passing. His Excellency the Governor-General has also advised the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Terence Drew, MP, of the death of the Sovereign and Head of the Commonwealth. Acting in accordance with established protocol, all flags in the Federation will fly at half mast until the day after the funeral. Her son, the heir to the throne, His Royal Highness Prince Charles, has been proclaimed as King. Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew has made an address on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. In it, he offered condolences to the family. It is with profound sadness that we, the government and people of St. Kitts and Nevis, mourn the passing and celebrate the life service and legacy of Queen Elizabeth II. We offer prayers for her, for her family and loved ones, and for all those who knew and loved her across the realms, the Commonwealth and throughout the world. Her reign marked by resilience, dignity, duty, quiet faith and piety has been and will continue to be an example for all of us. May her soul rest in eternal peace as reflection on her service continues. National hero and former Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, Sir Kennedy Simmons, joined the rest of the world in paying tribute to Queen Elizabeth, who died on Thursday. He issued a statement calling, recalling moments shared with the British monarch and offers his sympathies to her family and the people of the United Kingdom. 
the former Prime Minister was quoted as saying, it was with profound sadness that I learned of the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Hers was a life of unwavering devotion to duty, not only to the United Kingdom, but equally so to Commonwealth of Nations, including my own, St. Kitts and Nevis. I am saddened by her passing, which has closed the curtains on a, tra a transformative era that we may never again experience. My wife, Lady Simmons, joins me ex in extending heartfelt sympathies to Her Majesty's family and the people of the United Kingdom. Our prayers remain with you during this time of sorrow. Her Majesty's reign was not only one of longevity, but also a hallmark of le legendary public service, honor, distinction, and humility. Her Majesty's last visit to St. Kitts and Nevis was in 1985, and as Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis then, I was impressed by her knowledge and the keen interest she showed in the development of my Caribbean nation. I shall always remember our one-on-one -on -one conversations at the heads of Commonwealth meetings. She reflected a deep and abiding devotion to the welfare of the people of the Commonwealth, especially the youth. I extend best wishes to the new monarch, King Charles III, as he embarks on a new journey as head of state. After two years of shift systems and virtual learning, students across the Federation returned to classes at regular hours on the first day of school on Wednesday, September 7. Here's a look. It was announced that schools are going back to the accustomed 8.25 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. schedule, except on Thursdays when students are dismissed at 2.15 p.m. The schedule was changed to a shift system and hybrid classes during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic to facilitate the social distancing protocol that was mandated at the time. Our camera team caught teachers at Kaon High School meeting their students at the gate with encouraging words written on posters at, as they made their way to classes. The welcoming was capped off with a special visit by Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, the elected parliamentary representative for the area. It was the first school Dr. Drew visited since assuming the post of Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis. In his brief remarks, the Prime Minister informed the students of a number of decisions taken by his administration that will enhance the delivery of education across St. Kitts and Nevis. I want you to know that CFBC is now absolutely free for all of you who don't have to pay for CFBC. Let me see all of you who want to participate again in the laptop program. We will once again reintroduce the laptop program and make sure that all of you have access to a device if you don't have. We will also make sure that those who don't have internet at home, that we will help you to get internet at home because all of you must be connected to the internet. Prime Minister Drew also noted that his administration's goal is to ensure that there are no barriers to the education of the nation's youth. That we'll convert our schools into smart schools. We will include ICT and the technology so that we can create students who can compete with anyone from anywhere in the world. And that is our commitment to you, the students of St. Kitts and Nevis and the students of the Kayon High School. Dr. Drew then spoke about upgrades planned for the Kayon High School. Here at the Kayon High School is that your hall is too small and you should not be standing in the sun. And I want to make the commitment that we will extend your hall so that when persons like me come to speak, you can be in a hall, sheltered, and be able to recover. That is my commitment to the Kayon High School. Joining Prime Minister Drew during his visit to Kayon High were Cabinet Secretary Dr. Marcus Natta and Chief Education Officer Francil Morris. In recognition of their service to the Federation, 19 nationals were named recipients of national awards in September. Here's that report. The national awardees who will receive the, star, the Companion of the Star of Merit and the Medal of Honor have been named. Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew made the announcement during his National Heroes Day address on Friday. The awardees for the Companion of the Star of Merit, an award for long and meritorious service, 
or for loyal and devoted service to the nation are Eileen Gray for Education, Culture and Sport, Dennis Richards for Education, Arts and Culture, Lorraine Brown, Dr. Lincoln Carty, Wayland Vaughan and Violet Jones Monlaud for their contributions in education, Sylvester Charles for his contribution in education, music, sport and volunteerism, Maxwell Bass Sr. for music and security services, Nathan Esdale for education and religion, Shirley Kelly for nursing education, Lorna Ava Henry for culture and the arts, Pastor Lincoln Connor for nation building and youth development, Elsie, teacher Elsie Mills for education and religion, and Clement Juni Libert for broadcasting. Lloyd Lazar and Kenrick Georges will receive posthumous awards for their contribution in education and sport and arts and music, respectively. The awardees for the Medal of Honor, an award for outstanding and meritorious service to the nation, are Mabel Morton for community service and entrepreneurship, Clyde Richardson for Music and the Arts, and James Mickey Frederick for Performing Arts and Culture. Delivering his first independence address, Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew said, as the Federation celebrates independence, we look towards transitioning to a republic. Addressing the nation on the occasion of the 39th independence, Prime Minister Drew sought to answer the question, are we truly independent? Each independence season, it seems only right that we ask, are we truly independent? Are our people free? The debates are robust and lively in our barbershops, village bars and shops, and even in our homes among friends and relatives. While the answers will vary, I believe we can all agree that our Federation has come quite far since that day 39 years ago when we first uttered the words of our anthem, like children stand free on the strength of will and love. Our political independence was just the first step. Over the years, we have also built the foundation of our own social, economic, and cultural freedoms. I will confess, we are not totally free yet. As a small island nation, we depend on many partners internationally and regionally. Dr. Drew said as the country advances, our nation is much closer to true independence, pointing to the aim of transitioning to a republic. But we are on a path of continuous improvement for our people and our country. And as your fourth prime minister of this land, of which I am a very proud citizen, I am honored to lead our country along this path. Our nation is much closer to true independence than not. As we approach 40 years as an independent nation in 2023, we also set our eyes on transitioning into a republic. We trod on towards that goal. That goal of self-determination and self-actualization where we truly encapsulate our sovereignty. That is why each time I get the opportunity to speak to our nation's young people, I challenge them to be innovative, to be creative, and to envision a better St. Kitts and Nevis, and to use their immense skills to help get us there. The Prime Minister said the goal is to harness the immense power and unbridled talents of all our people for the prosperity of our nation. He also recognized the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, who was laid to rest in England on Independence Day. In early October, police intercepted the transfer of drugs worth millions of dollars when they seized bales of suspected substances from a boat. Here's more. The police force and the Customs and Excise Department have released a joint statement offering an update on the seizure of cocaine and cannabis that took place earlier this week. The statement indicated that on Tuesday, October 4th, 2022, at about 8 a.m., members of the St. Kitts and Nevis Customs Enforcement Division, the Anti-Narcotics Unit of the Royal St. Christopher and Nevis Police Force, and the St. Kitts and Nevis Defense Force Coast Guard Operational Division, conducted a joint operation at the Deepwater Harbor Port in Bird Rock Bastier, which involved the rummaging of cargo vessel MV Elizabeth C. According to the statement, the vessel is registered in Trinidad and Tobago with the International Maritime Organization, number 889474. 
The last port of departure prior to arriving at the port in Bastyr was St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The search operation was conducted between the hours of 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. During the search, several bales of white substance were found, which are suspected to be cocaine. Additional to that seizure was a quantity of compressed vegetable material in transparent vacuum-sealed bags, which were also found and are suspected to be cannabis sativa. The contents were concealed within the walls of the cabin of the vessel. The vessel had a crew of five adult males, three are nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, and two are nationals of Grenada and Caracu. The men and the suspected narcotics were taken into police custody, and the individuals are assisting the narcotics unit with the investigation. An initial count of the bales revealed that 32 were found. Each bale consists of 25 kilo blocks, which amount to a total of 800 kilograms of suspected cocaine. There were 16 transparent vacuum plastic bags with a total weight of approximately 12.9 pounds of suspected cannabis. The estimated treat value for the cannabis is approximately US 57,777 or EC $157,000. The investigation into the matter is ongoing. In late October, the National Assembly agreed to pass an amendment to the Public Health Act effectively removing all COVID-19 protocols. Here's more. Public Health Amendment Bill 2022 has been passed with the repeal of the COVID Prevention and Protection Act. During the first sitting of the National Assembly on Thursday, the Public Health Amendment Bill was moved by Prime Minister Dr. Terence Drew against the backdrop that COVID regulations were somewhat excessive. Restrictions on visitations, domestic travel was curtailed in many instances. I want us to see how these, even though this is a piece of paper, one piece of paper, the amount of effects that this one piece of paper can have on the lives of people is tremendous. And that is why we should not take these things lightly. We are now in a new space and a new normal as I seek to really repeal this act. The COVID-19 Prevention and Protection Act was repealed to form part of the existing Public Health Act, thereby being an amendment that allows COVID-19 to be dealt with in the future. This repeal does not mean if COVID comes back, we cannot respond in less than an hour. It means that where the legislation did not exist in a form to respond effectively to COVID, if there's even that thought, we have put a path in this new legislation to make sure that it does that. So we are stronger, we are better, and we are safer because of this action today. The opposition lent their support to the passage of the bill, with member for Nevis 10, Honorable Eric Evelyn, saying that he was happy about the repeal. The amendment to the bill was passed with no opposition vote. In November, Prime Minister Drew led his first official delegation to the Republic of China, Taiwan, where they were met with a military salute and parade. More in this report. Against the backdrop of cannon fire and fanfare, the Republic of China, Taiwan welcomed Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew and his delegation on their official visit. The military salute was held on the square in front of the presidential office, which is the standard protocol for every head of government when he or she visits Taiwan for the first time. Speaking with the assistance of a translator, President of the Republic of China, Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, welcomed Dr. Drew and his delegation and spoke of the strong ties between the Federation and Taiwan. St. Christopher and Nevis is an important ally of Taiwan in the Caribbean region. This is Prime Minister Drew's first visit to a diplomatic ally since he took office three months ago. This shows how highly he regards the bond between our two nations. Since establishing diplomatic relations 39 years ago, our countries have supported each other through good times and difficult times. And we continue to strengthen collaboration in all fields, yielding extremely fruitful results. Delivering brief remarks, Prime Minister Drew said the government of St. Kitts and Nevis is always ready to use its influence in international fora to advocate for values and principles which the country shares with Taiwan.
We therefore have no difficulty in promoting our shared values of democracy, good governance, human rights, and the rule of law. We believe firmly that the Republic of China Taiwan has a role to play in sustaining a vibrant global economy through manufacturing and exports, or export of quality goods and services. Taiwan can also be, contribute to the global effort to find solutions to pandemics, climate change adaptation and mitigation endeavors, disaster preparedness, food and livelihood security. And at the global level, Taiwan has assisted us in achieving sustainable development goals in all its dimensions. He said the government remains committed to sustaining and strengthening the bonds of friendship between the two countries, and they're anxious to meet with stakeholders from government and civil society to explore possible areas of cooperation aimed at bringing the people of both countries together and promoting their advancement. Following the military parade, the Prime Minister and his delegation attended a state banquet. On Wednesday and Thursday, the delegation will meet with various Taiwan officials and students from the Federation who are studying in Taipei. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. The Citizenship by Investment program and measures to improve the standard of living were among the topics discussed when Prime Minister the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew and his Cabinet of Ministers addressed the public at a press conference in November at the Marriott Resort to mark their first 100 days in office. The press conference aimed to highlight the achievements of the new administration's first 100 days in office. The head table included Deputy Prime Minister Honorable Dr. Jeffrey Hanley, Attorney General Honorable Gath Wilkin, Minister of Tourism Honorable Masha Henderson, Minister of Agriculture Honorable Samuel Duggins, and Senator Iseline Phillip. Regarding the Citizenship by Investment program, Prime Minister Drew said while it has been successful, the CBI has come under scrutiny and criticism. He noted that the government is working to strengthen the CBI and outlined steps to be taken. There will be much stronger oversight and leadership in the CBI unit. Your government is implementing strengthened legislative and administrative structures to ensure that real estate projects funded by the CBI program are completed. To this end, we are seeking trusted investors who see the potential of our nation to put capital behind creative and strong projects that will enhance our offering. Under new leadership, the CBI program will be administered in such a way that all stakeholders can have an equal opportunity to benefit and priority needs will be addressed. Regarding ways to improve the lives of the people, the Prime Minister also announced that three reduced VAT days have been approved in the coming weeks. As we navigate life after the pandemic, we continue to roll out our COVID-19 recovery plan initiatives. In this regard, and following consultations with the Ministry of Finance and others, the Cabinet has approved discounted VAT rate days on Friday November 25th, in this initial one, vehicles will not be included. And Friday, December 16th, and Saturday, December 17th, which will include vehicles. The Prime Minister also confirmed a double salary for civil servants to be paid next week. I'm therefore pleased to announce that after careful deliberation, an extra payment of one month salary, or what is termed double salary, will be paid on Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022. It just so happened that it is my birthday. <laughs> so that means I can ask for a lot of drinks. <laughs> to all civil servants, so it's paid to all civil servants and government auxiliary employees of St. Kitts and Nevis and the Nevis Island Administration including pensioners and step workers. The press conference was carried live on ZIZ radio, television and social media pages. At the end of October, a new ferry service was launched connecting St. Kitts and neighboring islands. More in this report.
Monday, October 31 saw the start of a new ferry service connecting St. Kitts, Seba and St. Martin. The Makana ferry docked to the port Zante Marina and was welcomed by officials from the St. Christopher Air and Seaports Authority and the St. Kitts Tourism Authority. With me is the owner of the Makana ferry, Mr. Samuel Connor. Welcome Mr. Connor. How does it feel, you know, the launch of this new service connecting St. Kitts and Seba and St. Martin? Very good. This is something I was looking forward to for a long time and it was the dream of the, um, the Dutch government to have a connection between Stacia and Sinkets and by extension we we'll include Sabre and St. Martin. So for us, for the Mekana, it's a blessing. What kind of benefits do you think this would bring for the two islands? I think it, it's, um, it's, it's a whole cultural benefit because you know Sinkets and Stacia have that historic connection and um, for, but for a while there was not a, a connection between islands and this gave the people of Stacia an opportunity to visit St. Kitts for medical or, um, or shopping purposes. So I think it's a win-win situation for the economy of St. Kitts and Stacia. How often will you be operating? We'll be operating twice, twice two trips, um, four trips a week, twice on a Friday and twice on a Monday. Okay, great. And how can people um, uh, book a trip? Will they have to go online or how does it done? Well, you can book online uh, by mechanoferry.service.com um, and we also have our local agents in Sinkets. Shop It For Less is our agent here in Sinkets. Ship it for less, okay. Ship it for less. Okay. Thank you very much. Now on the St. Kitts Nevis side of things, we have product development officer at the St. Kitts Authority, Golda Franks. Tell us what does this new ferry service mean for St. Kitts? Well at the St. Kitts Tourism Authority, we are extremely excited for the Makana Ferry Service to be now coming into St. Kitts. What this means is that there's a now an option for persons to travel to Sable Station and St. Martin and also for persons from those respective countries to come to St. Kitts when we're having various events as well as when persons want a, a weekend getaway there's also an option of travel. We can get more information from Mr. Shervin White, he's the local agent for the Makana Ferry Service. What can you tell us about this new service? Well this new service that we have started here in St. Kitts, I mean it's a long-awaited service. I mean um, to go to St. Martin Station and Sabre, to go to Station is an 80 US dollars round trip, to go to Sabre is a 105 US dollars round trip and to go to St. Martin, Jumwall is 190 US round trip. So it's a cost effective means of traveling right now because you know the regional planes are so expensive. So this is a welcome thing to, to, to St. Kitts. All right. And we definitely are looking forward to taking advantage of this trip. Thank you very much Thank to all of you. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with several officials connected to the launch of this new Makana ferry service connecting St. Kitts, Saba and St. Martin. It officially kicked off on Monday, October 30, 31. Reporting from the Port Zante Marina for ZIZ News, I'm Jason Davis. In November, the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society appointed its first honorary governors at an investiture ceremony at Government House. More in this report. The first five honorary governors of the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society, Asher Tapley Seaton, GCMG CVO QCJP LLD, who was unable to attend, Sir Edmund Lawrence, KCMG C GCMG OBE CSMJP, Kenneth Martin, MBE MH, Gloria Wilkin, and Larry Amoney. General Manager of the Brimstone Hill National Park Society, Percival Hanley, informed that the annual general meeting of the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society earlier this year, the Council agreed to invoke one of its articles for the very first time, which made allowance for the appointment of honorary governors. For each honorary governor, the citation for honorary governor was read and a medal pinned. Know all who read these presents that whereas the Articles of Association of the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society permit the appointment, and whereas the members of the society have in a general meeting held on 24th March 2022, authorized the Council of Management to confer the title of Honorary Governor. Now therefore, the Council hereby appoints Sir Edmund W. Lawrence, KCMG, GCMG, OBE, 
CSM JP, Honorary Governor of the Society. And all members of society are hereby charged ever to receive and honor him as such, given under our hands this third day of November 2022 and signed by D. Michael Morton, CBE JP President, and Michael M. Martin, JP Honorary Secretary. President of the Council, D. Michael Morton, CBE JP, said as members of the Council of Management of the Society, the honorees shared in making policy decisions that guided the development of Brimstone Hill. As a fiscally viable, accessible, historic site for almost 60 years. And much of that is due in no small part to the unwavering dedication of a few people who served the organization voluntarily over the years. They demonstrated true passion and a vision for the park that saw it elevated to the coveted status of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Even today, their interests and commitment are unwavering. And we, the Council, understanding the organization would not be where it is today, but for their sterling contribution, unanimously agreed that they deserve lifetime recognition. Prime Minister Honorable Dr. Terence Drew congratulated the honorary governors, noting that they are deserving of this recognition. Our Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park is known as the Gibraltar of the West Indies. When I hear the word Gibraltar, it conjures up notions of strength, support, steadfastness, and longevity. These superlatives and more aptly describe the five honorees we are here to celebrate today. So I am delighted to be here with you to celebrate these five long-standing members of the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society who will now become honorary governors of the society. These are indeed outstanding members, not only for the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society, but our Federation as a whole. You have made significant contributions in many spheres and are well deserving of this recognition. The Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society began in 1965 for the main purpose of restoring, preserving and managing Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park. In November, ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation received the Steward of Carnival Award at the Sugar Mass Awards. More in this report. The Steward of Carnival Award is given to individuals and entities for consistent and exemplary assistance to the production and promotion of National Carnival. Acting General Manager of ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation, Veer Galloway, spoke with host of Carnival Buzz, Scotticia Hendrickson, about how the media house has contributed to Carnival over the years. 61 years is a lot of years. Carnival is 51 years. So we have contributed in many, many ways. We um, gave them ideas of certain things that they can do. We also promote the Calypsonians and the Carnival Queens and the various shows that we had during the Carnival. We also brought the shows live for people in the diaspora could see. And ZZ played an integral part in Carnival. And not only them, but still we are making that contribution to Carnival. Meanwhile, the Carnival Committee has described the Sugar Mass Awards as a success. Held on Saturday night at the Marriott Resort, the awards honored persons and groups who have contributed significantly to Carnival over the years. In delivering brief remarks, Minister responsible for Carnival, the Honorable Samuel Duggins, spoke of the impact Carnival has had on national development, particularly the economy. As a result of Carnival, they are far-reaching and tremendous. Considering the vendors, hotels, the bars, the restaurant, the taxi men, and all of our creatives. It is this time of year when our overseas nationals all come home in large numbers and inject much needed foreign currency into our economy. And I do believe that with the new addition 
to the committee of a representative from the Sinkis Tourism Authority whose intention is to drive the international marketing of Carnival, I am sure that we will undoubtedly be bound to even greater economic gains. The awards were presented in various categories. Among them was the Gold Standard. That award provides special recognition to an individual who has rendered meritorious service to National Carnival on a continual basis throughout his or her lifetime and at various levels. The award was presented to Elston Elimat Nero, Claudette Polly Manchester, Derek V. Freights, Stanley Franks Jr. and Agnes Skerritt. Other recipients of the Steward of Carnival Award alongside ZIZ were Sidney Osborne, Dr. Vernon Vera, Rudy Morton, Alistair Williams, Clement Monarch O'Garrow, Sylvester Anthony, Noah Mills, Cynthia Hull, Antonio Abenati Liburd, Leona Warner Matthew, Osdell Scotty Hanley, Carib Brewery St. Kitts and Nevis Limited, and Anthony Eibel. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. Also in November, ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation's YouTube page hit a historic milestone by hitting 10,000 subscribers. Here's more. The YouTube page ZIZ Online is one arm of ZIZ's digital presence and production and social media coordinator Bevin Wilkinson said amassing 10,000 subscribers is a significant achievement. ZIZ has been going through a transition from traditional media to more new media and in 2019 we started a digital transformation and we had some investments made. After those investments were made in 2019, in 2020, of, as we all know, COVID passed around and a lot of things that weren't necessarily broadcasted or put on social media ended up being on social media. And fortunately, ZIZ was very much involved in that and I think that really helped to boost our subscriptions. Also, over the last two years, we have also really increased the amount of content that we put out on social media. So literally any chance that we got, we would go out and stream and broadcast on YouTube and Facebook and of course on our website and on TV, any chance we got. He said there are areas for ZIZ to do more online, but that requires significant investment. ZIZ's online presence has a long way to go. ZIZ needs some investments, and I think after those investments are made, we will be able to spread our wings more, we'll be able to create more content on our own, we'll be able to get more staff that could facilitate the creation of this content, and I think, I think it's looking up. If we can get you know, investments and get more eyes in and more sponsors and advertisers in, I think ZIZ can only go up from here. ZIZ Online's digital presence includes our Facebook page, Twitter and Instagram accounts and our website www.zizonline.com. Stories of courage, inspiration, valiant leadership, service and others were shared and celebrated at a special sitting of the federal parliament to recognize the 2022 group of the 25 most remarkable teens in St. Kitts and Nevis. At the award ceremony held at the St. Kitts Marriott Resort Ballroom on Wednesday, awards were presented by members of Parliament. The 2022 class of the 25 most remarkable teens in St. Kitts and Nevis are Dominic Williams, Sienna Henville and Maija Lake for youth activism, Malik Queeley and Quinaika Bradshaw for a personal decision to change, Darren Thomas for scholar-athlete and leadership, Denedra Evelyn and Tanaiki Davis for Courage to Overcome. Jazara Claxton and Shamari Roberts were awarded for sport. Awards for scholar athletes were presented to Kaylee L. Ward, Jamad Huggins and Niran Ward. The award in academics was presented to Brianna Brown, while academics and spiritual commitment was presented to Malika Benjamin. Additional awards went to Devante Brown and Brianna Paul for leadership and volunteerism, Tatiana Leader for entrepreneurship, Zara Brown for entrepreneurship and music, Laquandre Laurie for leadership and sports, Shekim Forbes for volunteerism, Omarion Bartlett for most promising, Donald Francis for spirit of hope, while Siandre Fleming and Malachi Tucker Gums were recognized for excellence in performing arts. 
Junior Minister of Youth Empowerment, Sir Honorable Isaline Phillip, was pleased that the young people were recognized for their excellence and for developing themselves by giving service to their communities and the society. In December, the government announced its first ever payout of CBI dividends to nationals and residents. More in this report. The government of St. Kitts and Nevis has approved the payment of a citizenship by investment dividend to the citizens and residents of the Federation. The CBI dividend is a share of the profits and retained earnings received from the citizenship by investment program. During his appearance on ZIZ Radio on Thursday, advisor to the Office of the Prime Minister, Austin Edinburgh, said that the CBI dividend will be facilitated through the St. Christopher and Nevis Social Security Board and will be distributed in two tiers or categories. First category is pensionable and pensioners. And the second category is classified as those who are not yet pensionable. He went on to explain the two categories, noting that the payments will be made this year. There are the pensioners and those who are pensionable already, even if they're not receiving it because they have not attained the age. What that means is that persons who have contributed 500 contributions and above. Once you have contributed 500 contributions, you are pensionable. Once you live to the age of 62. If you have only contributed 499 contributions, then you are not pensionable. And hence the second tier. This would be paid this year. It's the most that I can say. This is a new policy implemented by the government of St. Kitts and Nevis as a commitment by the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party's administration campaign pledge to the citizen, citizens and residents of the Federation. Just four months after the Federation's general elections, the Nevis Island Assembly held its own elections on December 12th with the Concerned Citizens Movement retaining power. The Concerned Citizens Movement, CCM, has been returned to the Nevis Island Assembly after the results of the elections on Monday. Before midnight, it was announced by Oakland Pete's Supervisor of Elections that District 1 was won by CCM's Honorable Spencer Brand. The district was also contested by J.D. Keynes of the Nevis Reformation Party, NRP, who secured 604 votes but lost by 27. District 2 was contested by the leader of the CCM and Premier of Nevis, Honorable Mark Bransley, and Dr. Patricia Bartlett for the NRP. Premier Mark Bransley was returned with 1,313 votes over Dr. Bartlett's 1,166 votes. Samuel Keynes of the Moral Restoration Movement secured 8 votes. In District 3, CCM's Honorable Eric Evelyn retained his district as well with 736 votes over the NRP's Rohan Isles with 311 votes. District 4 was taken by the Nevis Reformation Party's Honorable Dr. Janice Daniel Hodge. The party leader and newcomer beat Alexis Jeffers by 8 votes. It is the first time in 30 years that the NRP has won that district. Patricia Mills Jeffers of the MRM also contested that district and secured 11 votes. Meanwhile, Honorable Cleone Stapleton Simmons retained District 5 for the NRP with 712 votes over CCM's newcomer Latoya Jones, who secured 508 votes. Mervan Thompson for ZIZ News. New ministerial portfolios were announced in the Nevis Island Assembly where the, when they were sworn in on December 18. Members of government, invited guests and members of the general public were among those in attendance on Sunday afternoon for the swearing in of the ministers of the Nevis Island Assembly and the administering of the oaths. The ceremony was held at the El Camino Willett Park. His Lordship, Justice Patrick Thompson Jr. administered the oaths. Her Honor, Deputy Governor General for Nevis, Hylita Lybrid, witnessed and signed the oaths. The Honorable Mark Brantley is Premier and Minister of Finance, Statistics, Economic Planning, Human Resources, Industry, Trade and Consumer Affairs, 
tourism, public utilities and energy, foreign investments, government information service, and Nevis Television. The Honorable Eric Evelyn is Deputy Premier and Minister of Agriculture, Lands, Natural Resources, Fisheries, Cooperatives, Culture, and Housing. The Honorable Spencer Brand is the Minister of Communications, Works, Water Services, Physical Planning and Environment, Posts, Labor, and Disaster. The Honorable Troy Liburd is Senator with Ministerial Responsibility for Education, Information and Technology, Library Services, Youth and Sport. The Honorable Janelle Nisbet is Senator with Ministerial Responsibility for Health, Gender Affairs, Community Affairs and Social Services. The Concerned Citizens Movement won the Nevis Island Assembly elections on Monday, December 12, winning three districts to two. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. Now for a bit of sport. In May, the Queen's Baton passed through St. Kitts and Nevis as part of the worldwide Queen's Baton relay across the Commonwealth. Here's a look back at some of the notable events in St. Kitts. Governor General His Excellency Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, GCMG, CVO, QCJP, LLD, received the Queen's Baton at Government House on Friday. In welcoming executive members of the National Commonwealth Games Association, His Excellency said he was pleased to receive the baton as the Queen's representative. I feel privileged and honored to be able to receive the torch which will be used as part of a relay that will go around St. Kitts and Nevis and will transmit through transit through the other Commonwealth countries and be then present for the Commonwealth years in Birmingham, England into this year. I think it's a privilege for me as head of state and the representative of Her Majesty the Queen because the battle is a message from the Queen, which will be read at the gates in those that. And so that in itself provides quite an honor. President of the St. Kitts Nevis Commonwealth Games Association, Alfonso Bridgewater, spoke of the importance of the Queen's baton. Don't take the baton for granted. Man has very limited capacities and sometimes to understand the Bible, even Jesus did, he used a lot of stories, a lot of symbols. Similarly, the baton could be seen as a symbol to really appreciate what it stands for. Mm -hmm. it, it is a forerunner of the, the signature event of the Commonwealth Games. Whenever you hear of Commonwealth, you think of two things, the Commonwealth Caucus of Ministers, the Commonwealth Congress, and the only other thing you hear after that is the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. The 72 nations are spread across. All Leroy Green of the Commonwealth Games Association placed the significance of the moment into perspective as he gave a brief history of the Commonwealth Games. Sexual member of the Commonwealth Association organize a game every four years. There's a four-year cycle where they have these games. The last games were held in 2018 in uh, Gold Coast in Australia. In 2022 edition, will be held in Birmingham, in England. The Queen's Battle really traditionally starts at Buckingham Palace, traverses to all 72 member nations, and ends up in the host city just before the Games, at the opening of the Games. This year, the battle came to us from the BVI. We will then take that battle down to Anguilla, and the battle will go on and travel to the 72 nations and end up back in Birmingham. During the ceremony, Mr. Bridgewater presented Dennis Alfred Freddy Knight with the St. Kitts Nevis Commonwealth Games Award of Excellence. Mr. Knight was the first president of the St. Kitts Nevis Commonwealth Games Association when it was established in 1978. Sir Kennedy Simmons, a sport enthusiast, national hero and former Prime Minister, has participated in the Queen's Baton Relay while the baton passes through the Federation. During a handing over event at the National Heroes Park on Friday, Sir Kennedy shared his delight. I am very happy for this unique opportunity to participate in this, the 64th edition 
of the Queen's Baton Relay. The President and members of the St. Kitts and Nevis Olympic Committee, I express thanks and appreciation for your kind invitation to be involved in this and various other events linked to the relay. Sir Kennedy further reflected on past moments in his sporting life. After the photo opportunity with heads of the Commonwealth Games Association, Commonwealth Games gold medalist Kim Collins ran the baton to the Kim Collins Stadium and back to the Heroes Park. The baton arrived from the British Virgin Islands this week and was handed over on Friday. It departs the Federation on Monday, heading to Angola. In August, the St. Kitts and Nevis Patriots won the CPL 60 Men's Tournament. This was the first time the tournament has been held and it was hosted by St. Kitts and Nevis. Here's more. In a close match on Sunday at Warner Park, the Patriots beat the Trinbago Knight Riders 85 for 3 to 84. Dominic Drakes of the St. Kitts Nevis Patriots said despite the rocky start, the level of experience among the players gave the team the confidence to reach the finals and win. Like we, when we started competition, we started not on such a, such a hot note, you know, we lost and stuff. But if you see, we have a lot of experience and stuff. So we always knew getting to the finals, being there, players already playing a lot, multiple finals before. You know, everything was a job together. Following the game, Minister of Sport, the Honorable Samal Duggins, presented the players with the winner's medals. Andre Fletcher of the St. Kitts Nevis Patriots was named the player of the series. And now for some stories with a happy ending. In February, a lost hiker was found after being stranded in the rainforest for about 24 hours. More in this report. According to forestry officer in the Department of Environment, Dr. Eric Brown, a hiker, a Chinese resident identified as Mr. Lee, traveled along the Mount Liamiga Trail with a friend on Saturday, but got lost on his way back. Dr. Brown said initially a search party went out that same day and looked for him until nightfall. A second group resumed the search early Sunday morning. These comprise of the police, defense force, uh, search and rescue, and as well even the Boy Scouts were, were there. And along with two of the local guides also went, were called in and they went up and resumed the search for the hiker. That search took them um, all the morning, in the time of Sunday morning, and around about uh, two o'clock in the afternoon is when they really located, successfully located the lost hiker um, called Mr. Lee. Um, when they found him, he was in very exhausted, but in very high spirit. No injuries, just a bit disoriented. And, you know, from the night that, you know, a lot of rain, very cold, you know. And so he was just very grateful that um, to be found. He said Lee had apparently wandered off the trail and through the use of GPS and knowledgeable guides, they found him unhurt in a ravine along the trail. What happened is that he had walked off the trail and walked off the trail and went down into a ravine or what we would call a gut. Luckily that gut was, not, was running but not running um, so as to put him in any really danger as such. And so we got him back on the trail and then walked him out slowly where EMS was waiting and they took charge of him and really tended to him and took him away to give him further treatment. Dr. Brown said it's not the first time that someone has gotten lost on the way back and the rangers are taking steps to guide hikers on the return trip. Coming back, the blazing, what we call blazing, or the markings that we put, at points you don't um, see them properly when you're coming back. They are very visible when you're going. Also the trail, when you're coming back, the, um, it's very, it looks very different from when you're going up. You may miss certain landmarks that you see going up. Also, you're tired, you're disoriented when you're coming down. So you can take a wrong turn, right? And steps are being taken at this very moment um, to try and to rectify that situation in that particular area where he went off. Persons have gone off there as well. Presently, the rangers are there and erecting sign, a sign right there. We have directional signs, right? There are directional signs at other parts of the trail already. In that particular area, they're putting up a sign to direct you on the trail and to, for you to keep on the trail. 
He said the search for Mr. Lee was further complicated by the rain and fog in the mountains, and also, although they could reach him by phone, there was a language barrier as Mr. Lee did not speak much English. Overall, Dr. Brown said he is happy with the outcome, noting, quote, This was a successful outcome to what could have been a potentially grave or even fatal situation, end quote. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. Three nationals who starred in an international Bollywood film, 83, are describing it as a life-changing experience. Let's take a look. 83 tells the story of India's national cricket team that rises through the ranks to their World Cup victory in 1983. Orson Nurse, Jace Taylor and Shino Berridge are playing members of the West Indies team who face off against India in the final match of the movie. Berridge, who plays Sir Andy Roberts, said this was a great achievement which put the spotlight on talent from St. Kitts and Nevis. For someone like me to get such a, a great big opportunity is a, a very glorious feeling. Seeing that I never had such seen myself such a big screen. I get the opportunity to be um, in a, a movie which I never thought of. Being to the cinema was, was one of the biggest feelings seeing myself on the, the big, big screen. Orson Nurse, who plays Sir Clive Lloyd, said that this type of visibility for nationals on the big screen can have a positive impact on young persons who dream of being an actor. I know when you know youngsters stop me in the street, you know I get stopped by more youngsters than actually adults, who are saying, "Boy, Orson, well done," you know, because I, I, you know they're all over social media, the, the younger generation, you know. So for me, it was like. But yeah, I'm glad that I got the opportunity to do this. So it's kind of like a stepping stone where the youths are seeing that somebody from Bakayad could do it. So I could do it. Arsene could do it. Jace could do it. Sheena could do it. But we could do it. Jace Taylor, who plays Sir Vivian Richards, said the experience was unforgettable, even though the work days could be very demanding. I've played professional cricket and it's tough, right? Transition into the acting scene, it's a little tougher because your your rest period is very limited. You know, you get up one day, you do 17 hours, and you get up the next day, you're doing that again and again. You know, doing like probably six days straight, and you get a little break. You know, on your downtime, you want to venture out still, you're in your country. You want to go see a little sights, do a little shopping and stuff like that. But it was brutally intense. I think he had a dead. It was like 104 degrees, right? And we had to shoot a scene in sweaters. So you could imagine that, right? So like every little chance we get, we had to rush off, get water, take a little break, find some cool shit. So. Earlier this week, a screening of 83 was held at Caribbean Cinemas for a limited audience. Nurse said the reception was very positive and they hope to hold another screening at a later date. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. In late November, a student from the Federation had the rare opportunity to speak to an astronaut on a space station. Here's that story. Students in St. Kitts and Nevis and 11 other countries in the region had a direct conversation with an astronaut in the International Space Station on Tuesday afternoon. The students, chosen from Antigua and Barbuda, Cayman Islands, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Panama, the Dominican Republic, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Trinidad and Tobago were selected from 26 participating countries. The 14 students were able to speak live to NASA astronaut Josh Casada on board the International Space Station ISS. During this event, the students had the opportunity to learn about natural hazard research and monitoring as seen from the unique perspective of an astronaut on the International Space Station. Then six-year-old author Corin Anaya Clark for Tr from Trinidad and Tobago held a pop-up shop along with her Kittishan father Ron Clark for three publications at Flo Fort Street in January. Here's more. In an interview with ZIZ News, Corin spoke of her three books that have so far been published. This is my first book, Chronicles of Corin, Seven Days of Fun, and it's about me doing fun stuff for my family in my hometown, Trinidad. This is my second book, Chronicles of Corin, Adventures in St. Kitts and Nevis, and, and, it, and it's about me going to visit my, my relatives in St. Kitts and Nevis. 
and this is my third book, Chronicles of Corrid Gratitude Drill and Activity Book. And, and, it, and it's about, and then it helps children to explore their emotions and give thanks to all the good, great stuff in their life. And her father, Ron Clark, shared that he will continue to support her future goals and projects. She already has her plans. I think um, I would like to see her accomplish what she wants because she, as of the end of last year, she actually told us it would be awesome if she could have seven books by the time she's seven. <laughs> so we're trying. So she has three so far. Three. She has plans for, for some others. I don't know if she's at seven yet, but we're just going to try to support her to get to, to her goal of seven. And when asked what's next, Corin said that she'd like to go back to Antigua and write a book about her experience there entitled Chronicles of Corin, the Curious Ballerina. And that's it for Rewind of the Year in Review 2022. On behalf of the management and staff of ZIZ Broadcasting Corporation, we'd like to wish you a bright and prosperous 2023. I'm Jason Davis. And I'm Kyla Barrage.